Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you like a blanket? That was the voice I heard of a nurse speaking to a nervous patient on the other side of a curtain as I was waiting in the examination room of Baptist Health Surgical Center. They asked the woman if she needed a blanket because um, she could not stop trembling, but it wasn't because she was cold, but it was because she was very afraid. I could relate because I was waiting on the next bed over on the other side of that curtain, also waiting for my own medical procedure. It was April 24th, about 9 a.m., and they had placed me in this area where I was surrounded on all sides by curtains. So I couldn't see the people around me, I couldn't see the people in the bed next to me, but I could hear everything. I could hear the conversation between the nurse and the patient next door. I could hear the house radio playing pop music very softly. I could hear the beeping of monitors and devices and machines um, inside the area. And the other thing I could hear was this incessant voice going on and on in my head, asking one question. If you don't wake up from the procedure, where will you go? Now I want to admit to you today that even as a pastor, I can have moments of doubts about my salvation. Now if I as a pastor can have doubts, then I'm pretty sure that all of you can have doubts too, right? I want you to think back to a moment when you were facing your unknown. Maybe it was a surgery or medical procedure. Maybe you were being arrested. Maybe you were getting divorced or you lost your job. Whatever that moment is, whatever that moment of uncertainty, the thing I want to let you all know is that all of us, even pastors, all of us need a pastor in those moments of doubt. All of us need a prophet named Isaiah. Isaiah's very name means God is salvation. And here are a couple of verses from Isaiah chapter 12 of what that prophet actually says. He says, God is our salvation and I will trust in him and not be afraid. Afraid of what? Well, for the people of Judah, his original audience, they were afraid of a king named Pekah. He was the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. He had allied himself with Rezin, the king of Ram. And it says in scripture that in one day, he killed 120,000 of Judah's troops and then carried away some 200,000 men, women, and children as captives. Judah was afraid of Israel. And they were afraid of Ram, but they were also afraid of the Philistines. The Philistines had attacked some of their towns and, and taken over some of their villages and were occupying some of their territory. That is what the people of Judah were afraid of. But if someone were to look at the headlines in our newspapers and on the news stations that we see, some of the things we'd be afraid of would probably be a nuclearized Korea or Iran or a terror attack from ISIS, or perhaps a deranged person with an automatic rifle barging into our school or into our church. But for me, on April 24th, the thing that I was afraid of was something worse than those things. A few years ago, there was a Japanese man who was Buddhist, but he was interested in Christianity, so I took him on a hospital visit to a man who was dying. And on our drive away from the hospital, this man asked me, he says, you know, Tony, as a Christian, as a Christian, are you afraid of dying? And so I answered him, well, no, I'm not really afraid of dying, but I guess I'm more afraid of how I will die, if it'll be some long, grueling, torturous process. But then, 
Now, April 24th, my fear was less about even how I would die, but what would happen after I died. The way we, we often try to comfort ourselves at times is with our own good deeds. You know, so as a pastor, I'm thinking of all of the cool things that I do as a pastor, right? I get to preach, baptize people, I get to care for people and do all these things and, and, and sort of, I want to put my trust in all those pastorly deeds. And yet, Jesus says something that's really quite troubling that I remember from Matthew chapter 7, which I'll share with you. In the Gospel of Matthew, he records Jesus as saying these words for those who are thinking about their good deeds. He says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy, preach, in your name? And did we not drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doer. The thing that was most sobering for me as I was lying on that gurney there in Boca at the surgical center was that I am an evildoer. I'm an evildoer and so are you. You want to know Martin Luther's test to know how you're an evildoer? Okay, so everybody do this. Take your right hand and put it over your heart. Do you feel anything beating inside there? Because if you do, then you are an evildoer. Now, now I know, I know some of you uh, don't like hearing that. You want to say that I'm a good person. Yes, but even as a good person, don't you admit that you sin? Of course you do, because at the beginning of service, that's what we all did. We all admitted that we are sinners. We sin against God in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved God with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Therefore, we justly deserve his present and eternal punishment. That is what I was afraid of as I was lying and preparing for that examination. See, when we're honest with ourselves and when we're honest with God, we know that our good deeds cannot save us, but we remember what Isaiah is saying, that God is our salvation. I really appreciate the way that is stated in Hebrews. It says this, God is our Yeshua. God is our Jesus. You all remember the, the gospel reading that we had this morning about the man named Simeon? He had gone to the temple courts and when he was there, Mary and Joseph had brought this baby and when he received that baby and cradled the baby in his arm and he looked at the baby, he then said to the Lord, Lord, you can now dismiss your servant because my eyes have seen the Lord's salvation. Therefore, because Simeon, this elderly gentleman, had seen the Lord's salvation, he was no longer afraid to die. He was no longer afraid of how he was going to die or what was going to happen after his death. He saw and held in his own hands God's salvation. Well, all of you, everyone, and this is my proclamation to you, is that today you have come to a temple court. And it is here that you can see and hold in your hands God's salvation. What you see here in the temple courts is thou how we evildoers receive God's forgiveness and we are part of the communion of saints. We, the evildoers, are baptized and washed away of our sins. We, the evildoers, receive absolution, the forgiveness of sins. And we, the evildoers, receive Jesus Christ's body and blood and the bread and the wine of communion at the altar. It is here that you can see your salvation and hold that very salvation in your hands. 
So going back about three years ago, when at that time I was also on a gurney waiting to go in for my shoulder surgery, again, I had that question going on in my head. But this time the question was, at that time the question was, um, how do I know that Jesus is God? But I was comforted and reassured by all that I experienced here with you that God is a real person who was born into this world as a baby grew to be this man who was crucified for us and was truly present for us, rising from the dead and also promising to raise us from the dead. Through all of what we do here as the body of Christ, I was reassured of a very real, present, and tangible Jesus who is my and our salvation. Therefore, there is something that I, I just really appreciate about our experience here. And this is what the passage says. If I can have you open up to, to page five of your worship folder, I want to uh, look at the last verse of the song that the choir sang, which is sort of the last verse of, of uh, chapter 12 there. And this is on page five there at the very bottom. And it says this, for great is the one in the midst of you. For the great one in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. The great one in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. As we have gathered here in the name of Jesus, the communion of saints for the forgiveness of sins, Jesus Christ promises to be here among us. So it is as I was here, lying on the gurney, and I remember being here. I remember not my good deeds, but your good deeds, that you, the body of Christ, baptized me. That you forgave me of my sins, and you all gave me the body and blood of Christ. From this, I found a reassurance as I faced that procedure that God is my salvation. God is my Jesus and your Jesus. He is present here among you, living and active in his word. Therefore, Isaiah says, in that day, you will say, you will say, God is my savior. I will trust in him and not be afraid. And amen and hallelujah, we trust in Jesus Christ as the one who's had victory over death. We trust in Jesus as the one who has forgiven us of our sins. And we trust in God that when we have fallen asleep and lie in the grave, he will return in his glory to raise us and carry us to be with him and our Father in heaven forever. In that day, we will all say, we trust in God and we are not afraid. When we face those uncertain times in our lives, when we face that unknown, we can trust God and not be afraid. Therefore, since we trust this God, since we know who he is and we share him with one another, God has put us in a place where we can share that with others. You see, what I appreciate is that, you know, as a pastor, I actually go through the hardships that you go through. I face your unknowns also. I lie on a gurney as you lay on a gurney. I suffer doubts as you suffer doubts. But it is from that place when I am met by the living Jesus Christ and his word and through your ministry, then I can proclaim to all of you and declare that Jesus Christ is your salvation. In the passage um, that we have from Isaiah 12 here, the choir didn't sing this, but I would certainly like to share it with you. It says this, make his deeds known among the people. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things, and this is known to all the world. This thing about Jesus Christ being God and our salvation is known to all the world because you face the world's hardships. You face the threats from a nuclearized North Korea or from Iran or ISIS or even those deranged shooters who make those, those terrible entries into our schools, into our worship places. But it is in that unknown, it is in that place of fear where you proclaim that Jesus Christ is salvation and the world hears it. 
They know who he is because you proclaim who he is. You demonstrate who he is by your love and forgiveness of one another. So as I was walled in by these curtains and I could hear the voice of the lady on the other side, I kind of, it was going back and forth in my head as to whether I should reach out to her as she was so nervous. And so uh, then as I was lying there, I could hear a song playing over the radio and I thought, wow, this is way too perfect to just be coincidental. It's a song by Incubus and it's called um, Drive from 1999, it's called Drive. And I want you to hear just a, a chorus from that song real quick. What I'm saying is that whatever tomorrow brings, I will be there with open arms and open eyes. And so when I heard that, I decided to go ahead and reach out to the lady. I said, hello, hello, uh, person next door. And um, she answered. And I said, um, are you nervous? And she goes, yes, I'm very, very nervous. I said, well, I'm a pastor. And would you mind if I said a prayer for you? And she said, I would like that. And I go, what's your name? And she said, Renee. And so right there, through this veil, I prayed for Renee. And then when I said my amen, Renee said, thank you. I feel better already. God has placed us in this world. He's placed us in those gurneys. He's placed us in those unknowns so that we can make his deeds known to others so that they can also feel better. So that they can also trust in God and not be afraid. So that day, I went for a procedure to see what was going on inside of me, but actually, it wasn't what was going on with my organs that I learned, it was what was going on with my heart and with my faith. Because there, I discovered that I did have a threat to my soul, uh, but it was not cancer or anything like that, it was actually something called sin. And right when that began to terrify me, I was reminded by my memory of all of you that Jesus Christ is my salvation. I remembered not my sinful deeds or my good deeds, but I remembered your good deeds done in the name of Jesus. I remembered your love and forgiveness for me. I remember the baptism I received among you, the forgiveness of sins I received from you, and the fellowship of the altar that I received within you. I remember that in our midst, as we are communing saints and forgiving one another their sins, that Jesus Christ is also present, tangibly and living among us. And because I have a Jesus like this, because we have a Jesus like this, we know for sure that he is our salvation. He is our Jesus. Therefore, we will trust in him and not be afraid. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.